Thousands of people from this country and different parts of the world tour the Fenton Art Glass Company. The factory is located in Williamstown, West Virginia, just across the Ohio River from historic Marietta, Ohio. Once you have seen the making of Fenton Glass, you will appreciate and admire the time and skill that go into the creation of each piece. As you watch the ancient art of making fine glass by hand, you will see a unique blend of centuries-old skills and tools and computer-age glass technology. It is the historically respected skill of Fenton craftsmen which imparts the ultimate beauty to each handcrafted piece of glass. Step back with us now to see glass making the Fenton way. You are about to witness something that has become a rarity in this day of growing mechanization. The skilled glass craftsman who takes pride in his work is very much alive here. Pride and tradition flourish in a vital role that is essential to the production of the entire line of quality Fenton art glass. You are watching the production of Fenton's famous cranberry opalescent glass. Later you will see the same process being used to make cranberry glass. This is cranberry glass without the opalescence. Other colors and treatments made by Fenton are hobnail milk glass, hand decorations, rosaline, Burmese. We are proud of our facility and the dedicated craftsmen and women who create this all-American glass. We are pleased to have you join us, and we hope that you will enjoy seeing the creation of handmade glass. The first process in making Fenton glass is the mixing of the batch. The basic ingredients in the batch are pure white silica sand, soda ash, and lime. Other chemicals are added to create color or to give the glass special physical properties. For example, copper will give a blue color, iron or chromium will make green colors, selenium and cadmium sulfide will give us Fenton's ruby red. Fenton milk glass requires both fluoride and aluminum and of course our famous cranberry glass contains gold and other important metals in its batch. The batch is mixed and then taken out into the factory where it will be charged into a furnace at a temperature of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. The mixture is melted down into a workable molten viscous fluid. The production of this lampshade starts in the hot metal department of our factory. This group of 10 workers is called a blow shop. A core gatherer gathers a gob of molten glass from the furnace on the end of a hollow blow pipe. He blocks the gob in a block of wood or metal placed in a tub filled with soapy water, which reduces friction between the glass and the block. He then blows the first bubble of air to enter the piece. The glass is then handed to a blocker who gathers more glass over the core that was made by the core gatherer. The blocker again blocks the piece in a large block which shapes the glass, making it smooth and even, and cools it a bit. He then blows more air through the blowpipe into the glass. The bubble must be blown with just the right amount of air, because that bubble must be located in just the right place in the glass. The blocked glass is cooled beneath an air hose, and then given to a man on the platform called the blower. The blower reheats the rough-shaped piece in the reheating furnace, otherwise known as the glory hole. The blower then rolls the pipe of glass across a flat steel plate called a marver to obtain a shape similar to that of the blow mold. He then drops the viscous piece into its final mold. The blower must expertly blow into the glass with the proper amount of air. A small amount of compressed air is used to fill out the mold and the indentations in the mold without too much burden on the glass blower, but he still has to use his own breath to complete the job and form a bubble called the overblow on top of the mold.
From the mold, the ware is taken by the warming in worker, who places it in a snap and grinds off the excess glass from the overblow. The ware is then reheated in the glory hole until it becomes hot enough to be shaped, crimped, flared, or straightened by the finisher, also called a gaffer. The finisher uses a cherry or apple wood paddle because fine-grained woods won't mark the very hot glass, and a pucellas, or tool, as it is called by the glass workers. With these tools, he flares out the upper edge of the shade, he carefully folds back the upper lip, and very gently pulls it forward in three different places. His sense of timing must be honed just right because he works the glass just as it is on the verge of becoming immovably chilled. The piece is then taken by a carry-in worker and put into an annealing leer or an annealing furnace to be slowly tempered and cooled. This process removes the stress and strains from the glass to prevent it from cracking when it cools to room temperature. The quality inspection of each piece of Fenton glass begins the moment it is formed in the hot metal department. Every worker assumes responsibility for quality checking each piece he handles. They realize, as you should, that every piece of our glass contains some kind of tool or mold mark or small bubble or streak. Actually, there is no such thing as a completely perfect piece of handmade glass. The frequency and size of the mark determines whether the piece meets Fenton's quality standards. Each piece is checked several times before reaching the quality selector who passes final judgment. The finest glass, that which meets the selector's rigid standards, receives the Fenton sticker and is sold in fine stores and gift shops throughout the country. Pieces that don't quite meet our first quality standards are classed as preferred seconds and sold in the factory gift shop. The rest are rejected and destroyed. Some can be crushed and recycled either in our glass or in marbles made elsewhere in West Virginia. The first piece of Fenton glass was made in 1907. The company, a family-owned business, was started in 1905 as a decorating company in Martins Ferry, Ohio by Frank L. Fenton, John W. Fenton, and Charles H. Fenton. By 1910, Robert C. and James E. had joined their brothers. After a period of time, the brothers decided to make the entire product and move their operation to Williamstown, West Virginia. Later, the second generation, Frank, Bill, Robert C. Jr., James D., and Herbert Fenton oversaw the operation. Today, the third generation is running the company. If you are interested in learning more about Fenton and antique glass, be sure to visit the Fenton Art Glass Museum, where you can see a wide variety of beautiful antique glassware and learn more of the Fenton history. Here are the age-old glassmaking tools used by Fenton skilled glass workers. We see a pucellas, also known as a tool, a wood jack, and metal shears. The molds are also tools in glassmaking. Like the glass, all of the molds are made right here at the factory. The cast iron forms arrive here with just a rough interior. The mold makers make glass come alive by using hammer and chisel to carve intricate designs in the raw surface. The work is very meticulous and painstaking, but always gratifying. It may take three months or longer to make just one mold. The orange tree and cherry basket, known to carnival collectors as the cherry chain pattern, has the distinctive cherry chain pattern on the inside and the orange tree pattern on the outside. The outside pattern is imparted by the mold. The inside pattern is imparted to the glass by the plunger. This basket is made in what is called a press shop. We call this man a gatherer. He gathers glass on the end of an ancient tool called a punty. He must be very careful to shape the gather so that it will drop into the mold with only a small tail left for the presser to cut off. Just as a gatherer must gather the right weight, the presser must be even more precise in judging the right amount to cut off. Too little and the mold will not fill. Too much and the mold will overflow. Even the temperature of the mold is important. If too cold, the glass will be wavy. If too hot, the glass will stick to the mold. After the bowl is pressed into the shape of the mold, it is carried over to the warming-in worker who puts the bowl into a snap, a set of jaws on the end of a long pipe. The bowl is placed into the glory hole to be reheated so it can continue to be worked and shaped. 
He then turns it over to the finisher who will put the final shape on the piece. Before the bowl is completed, the handle must be ready. Handle gatherers gather the handle and roll it out on a marver. The handle is kept hot. It is then passed to the handler who quickly attaches it to the bowl. The handler lifts the handle, twists, and cuts it off. He uses his personal signature stamp to make his mark. No two handler stamps are the same. The handler uses a tool which is round and made of brass to shape the handle. The wood paddle is also used. The shaping must be done quickly because the handle will soon cool. While still very hot, the basket is then sprayed with a mixture that includes tin chloride and other metallic salts. This is the material which causes the glass to become iridescent, like oil on water. After the basket is sprayed, it is carried to the annealing layer by the carry-in worker. Other popular items are animal figurines. Here we see a cat made in a press shop. Once again, glass is gathered. The precise amount is cut off into the mold. The presser pulls the rotary side lever press plunger down, forcing the glass into the cavity of the mold. The mold has to be kept at just the right temperature. After the lever on the press is released, the rotary press moves the next mold into position. The turning out worker takes the glass from the mold and places the figurine on a hanger where it can cool enough to hold its shape. At the same time, the presser is cutting another piece of glass to make the production of the cat more efficient. After the cat is cooled a little so that it won't lose its shape, it is fire polished in a glazer. The cat is then sprayed with a mixture of metallic salts to cause the glass to become iridescent. The cat is attached to a fount needed to force the glass into the figurine mold. This fount is later cut off and discarded to be recycled. The figurine is leered and sent to the finishing department where the fount is cut off and the cat is finished like all our figurines. This crackle glass pitcher is a blown item. This pitcher, being a larger piece of ware, starts with a double gathering. The first gatherer is the core gatherer. He gathers a gob of molten glass from the furnace on the end of a blowpipe, blocks it, and blows the first bubble of air into the piece. He must be an expert at judging the right amount of glass to gather so that each piece of ware is neither too heavy nor too thin. The glass is then handed to a blocker who gathers more glass over the core. The blocker again blocks the piece in a tub of soapy water. The water serves as a lubricant, chilling the outer skin of the glass so that when a bubble is blown, the air will stop when it reaches the chilled surface. Next, the glass is given to a striker. He dips the glass into a tub of water one to three times. This causes the crackle effect. It is then carried to the glory hole for the blower to shape some more. He reheats it, dips it once again, and then hands it to the main blower who will reheat it some more. The blower rolls the pipe across the marver to shape the glass. He blows more air into it, then he drops the glass down into a mold. He uses his own breath, then compressed air, to provide a major force of air through the pipe, filling out the glass to fit the mold. He usually finishes it off with his mouth blowing the last little bit of air which produces the small bubble at the top of the mold. This is the way to separate the glass from the blowpipe. The bubble on top is called an overblow. The blower stretches it out to the side so that the mold holder can snip it off at that point. 
It keeps broken glass from dropping into the still molten glass in the mold. After it is cooled, the piece is removed from the mold. The warming in worker will take the piece, check it, put it into a snap, and break off the thin layer of glass at the top. It is then reheated. After being reheated, the piece is sheared into an irregular shape. It is once again reheated in the glory hole. Afterward, the pitcher is taken to the finisher who shapes the top and puts the lip in the pitcher. Now the pitcher will be readied for the handle. Once again, a gob of glass is gathered. It is then rolled on a marver and it is reheated. The glass will then be taken to the handler who applies the handle to the item, shaping it until it's cool enough to hold its shape. The pitcher is then taken to be sprayed with metallic salts which will make it iridescent. Afterward it goes to the annealing leer. The making of Fenton's cranberry glass is a very complicated process. It starts with a melt of lead glass batch, which has gold, antimony, tin, and iron, as well as other glass making chemicals such as potash, lead, and sand. To get a thin film of gold ruby glass encased in a layer of crystal or opalescent, requires us first to make ruby rolls out of the gold ruby batch and then chill them slowly to room temperature. When ruby rolls are needed for cranberry glass, they are put in an oven for a period of time at a temperature of 1000 degrees. This allows the gold molecules in the glass to grow and consolidate. The ruby rolls change color from a greenish yellow to a very, very deep red. After the ruby roll is heated and changes color, it is picked up by a worker and put in the glory hole to bring it up to the temperature at which it can be worked, around 1600 degrees. It's then taken to the caser, who cuts off a small chunk of the roll and connects it to the end of a hollow blowpipe. After it is reheated by another casing worker, it's brought back to the caser, who shapes it with a cupped metal tool and introduces a small bubble of air into the piece of glass on the end of the pipe. The pipe is carried over to the blow shop gatherer who gathers a gob of glass on the end of the pipe, covering the gold ruby entirely and evenly with crystal glass. The piece is blocked in the soapy water to shape the glass. The blocker distributes the weight to provide a thin skin on the outer portion of the glass. This is to contain the air blown in the bubble so that the air will not break through. He rolls it on a marver to help shape it for the mold. And when shaping and distributing are finished, the glass is blown in a spot mold or optic mold which has a pattern on the inside. The glass still on the end of the pipe is then taken to the glory hole and reheated. The blower shapes it some more and drops it into its final shaping mold. After using compressed air, he will then blow it with his mouth to get the fine touches that are required at the end of the blowing process. After the piece has cooled in the mold enough for it to hold its shape, the mold holder opens the mold and removes the piece of glass. The warming in worker picks it up and breaks off the thin layer of glass at the top, puts it in a snap, and reheats it. It is then carried to the finisher who shapes it, puts the crimp in it, 
and shapes it some more. The basket is now ready for the handle. The gathered glass is rolled on a marver. On this particular piece, we want a ribbed, twisted handle, so the glass is inserted into a ribbed mold, then reheated and taken to the handler. Great skill is required of the craftsman who puts the glowing ribbon of glass to the piece, forming a loop and then attaching it to the other end. After twisting the handle, he attaches it with his special stamp. Remember, the design on the stamp he uses to affix the handle is his alone, and every Fenton handle can be traced to the craftsman who created it. He then works it into a graceful arch, straight and true. Our hot metal workers are not the only craftsmen here. We take great pride in the fact that our glassware is hand decorated by our own artists. Here we see the paint used is made from a finely ground glass called frit. Frit contains color oxides and ground glass which has the consistency of facial powder. This powder is then mixed with turpentine and oil to make the paint medium. The artists are tested by a decorating committee which will determine which artists will become part of the Fenton decorating department. These artists take great pride in their work, signing their names to each piece they decorate. After the glass is hand decorated, it is put into a leer and reheated to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. This ensures fusion of the pigments with the glass, making it all one piece. The artwork is quality checked several times before it is shipped out. Fenton has a separate gift shop in which to showcase items like those we've just seen. The gift shop sells our first quality glass at the same price charged by department stores and gift shops throughout the country. Seconds and closeouts are available at reduced prices. And the gift shop also carries a wide range of other gift products and collectible items. Tours of the factory are available Monday through Friday except national holidays and our annual vacation early in July. The tours are free and are given by knowledgeable and courteous guides who take groups to watch highly skilled craftsmen create America's finest handmade glass. Also be sure to visit our glass museum. For over 85 years, Fenton has been making its mark in the glassware world with a quality product. A shining example that craftsmanship is not a thing of the past. It survives. It survives to produce unique and beautiful pieces of handcrafted glassware that are proudly owned by glass collectors throughout the world. At the Fenton Art Glass Company, we still make glass by hand in the age-old manner, just as it was done a hundred years ago,